disclaimer this time, right? Yeah, and the disclaimer is nope. Nope. no disclaimer, good. And Alan stands before us in the power stance, feet wider than the shoulders, managing attention, communicating, respect non-verbally, fighting friendly eyes near the front and center. Say your name, feel the love, start your speech. Hi class, my name is Alan. Hi Alan. I was a newlywed when my new wife became very sick. I rushed her to the emergency room and fortunately, two hours later, she was released with the doctor saying that uh, it was nothing serious, she'd be fine in a few days. We were relieved. Until she received a surprise $7,000 hospital bill. That's when I realized that this healthcare system needs to change. So my question is, in today's politics, can it be done? Or is it bipartisan healthcare overhaul? Fantasy. My answer is, in the current political climate, there is exactly a snowball's chance in hell of a bipartisan anything, let alone a healthcare overhaul. Now let me give you three reasons why I say that. One, is that it is an extremely divided political atmosphere. Two, is that is a special interest interference. Uh, three, is misinformation is creating divide among the public. So until these crippling elements are fixed, then a bipartisan healthcare overhaul is just wishful thinking. Now, let me explain my first point, which is the increasingly divided political atmosphere. Obamacare. Just the name stirs up controversy. Democrats want to keep it, Republicans want it gone, but increasing divisiveness is making any hope of a real healthcare overhaul seem farther away. In fact, according to a New York Times article from January 2018, healthcare has been at the heart of government shutdowns and bitter showdowns. This divided government is vulnerable to exploitation. And this brings me to my second point, which is special interest interference. So trying to pass a healthcare overhaul in today's political world is complicated enough. But add special interest interference and it gets messy. These groups use campaign contributions to buy powerful influence in Washington. For example, according to Time Magazine article from October 2016, the insurance industry, a powerful interest group, contributes millions towards governor elections from both political parties. This is to ensure that the winners appoint business-friendly regulators. They are literally contributing to and profiting from our devices. And this also brings me to my point, which is misinformation. Politics are already very divided, but when you combine misinformation and the viral nature of social media, then the thought of the public possibly banding together for anything, let alone healthcare, becomes more and more impossible. For example, according to a Newsweek article from February 2018, uh, the biggest culprits of divisive misinformation have been websites such as Infowars.com and 4chan, whose proven false stories, such as hashtag the storm, have even begun to be repeated by members of Congress. Sites like these only serve to further poison any hope of unity. In summary, I've given three reasons that are holding back a bipartisan health care overhaul. That is, one, the extremely divided political atmosphere. Two, the special interests exploiting this divide. And three, misinformation that is deepening the divide beyond repair. So all of this means that there are probably still going to be surprise $7,000 medical bills in many of our futures. The only way to change this fate is to change these major problems dividing us. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Let's start over here. That was 350. I was running long, I was speeding up. Never apologize. Let's we'll start over here. Hi, Hi Elizabeth. So, I really liked, um, well, how concise you were, and also how you were, kept it really simple. It was healthcare, so it could be boring, but I thought it was really interesting, and I also liked how you explained how, you know, it's like very persuasive that nothing's going to happen because of these reasons. So, I like that. Hi, I'm Cheyenne. Hi, Cheyenne. Cheyenne. 
Uh, I want to start by saying I really liked the personal story you added about healthcare, taking it from the abstract to the personal. But I think the no cards hindered the uh, emotional impact it could have had as you were reading it more than making eye contact with the audience. Yes. Did you, okay, write, your, did you write your whole speech on a note card? Uh, close it. Close it? Okay. So you want to know the trick to ditching your note cards? Uh, just putting bullet points or something. Yeah, bullet points. So less is more. Yeah. So just get used to, like, you can have your, like, when you start memorizing your speech, you can write it out whole, by whole. And then as you feel more comfortable, start going with bullet points. And at some point, you'll have it. You look at the bullet point, and you'll be able to recall your speech. So just work on that. Thank you, Daniel. Let me remind everybody that if you want to break the 90% barrier, you've got to ditch the note card. And I know all of you want to break that barrier, so let's ditch it, especially for the third speech for the impromptu. Okay. No note card. No need for sources. We got the hat. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, if you need to, if you, you don't, God didn't give you a memory to memorize sources. Why is it that Camille does hers without memory? Because Camille is lazy. Uh-huh. All right, well, I'll leave all that alone. You got um, Daniel, I like your uh, beginning. Your personal story. It was filled with angst and interest. You rushed to the hospital. It turned out that everything was okay until you got the bill. So that was a good way to tell the story. And then you, a little bit, just a little bit more with your voice. Seven thousand dollars. Oh my God! Right? Yeah. And uh, one thing I guess we'd be sort of interested in knowing is, are you still paying it off, or did he get it worked out, or how'd that all go? But that's just another, that's your business. So, when you ask the question, in today's politics, can something be done about health care, or is it a fantasy? You clearly took the position that it was a fantasy. Um, and let me say that you presented uh, three reasons why it was a fantasy, but I agree with the second speaker, Cheyenne, that you could have had maybe some personal stories in each one, so it would have been a little more interesting and compelling. You had clearly about a full minute and almost a half to put in more details, longer quotes, and that sort of thing. The second overarching thing before I go through the specifics is just this. That it's important for us to know when your quote starts and ends so we know when it's the New York Times talking and not talking and then Alan starts up talking and not talking. Okay? So that's like a, maybe a pause after the... Yeah, or just say the New York Times said, <coughs> unquote. So you see, then, then there's no question, of, and you didn't even have the quotes in the written version, so I didn't know. So, okay? Um, <clears throat> the second thing I want to go over with you, and, I, and by the way, you're a likable speaker. I'm going to do your hand, let them be by your side naturally. Um, uh, let me add to what uh, Daniel started to comment on, which is how to you to learn a speech without using a note card, and that is you do what I call a meta rehearsal. You have to memorize the seven parts. Intro, thesis, sig statement, main body, summary, conclusion, and tie back. Those must be in your head, in your mind, in your body, and you can easily do that, right? And say it backwards, too, right? So you don't have it just forwards, but you have that backwards. You have a tie back, you have a conclusion, you have a 
summary. You have a main body, you have a significant statement, you have a thesis preview, and then you have the intro. Let me just finish my company, Daniel. So, you know the schematic, and you know we're using it all quarter, so you know where you are and what you have to do next. Now, I found that after going through it a few times, if you do a meta rehearsal and just, it sounds something like this. First, I'll do the intro where I'll talk about my wife being pregnant, going to the hospital and get a $70,000 bill. Then I'll have my thesis where I'll say no, and I'll give three reasons and say the reasons right there. Then I'll have my significant statement, you say a few words about it. Then I'll have my first reason, and you say it. My second reason, and say it. My third reason, and say it. Then I will summarize, and I will conclude by talking about the $7,000 bill. I'll put the tie back first, as you did in this case. And then I will summarize, and then I'll conclude with, there's no way out of this mess. And if you, do it, if you do that meta rehearsal where you don't say it actually, you don't try to say it over and over again word for word and the way you wrote it out word for word, on, you need to trust your memory. It's a muscle that you have to use. And just look down and look up and see if you can't do it that way and see if that doesn't help. Daniel, do you have something yeah, yeah. to add? So how do you memorize your past speech? Uh, just reading it over and over and over. So you read your whole speech? Ten times. Or okay. front to back. Front, front to back. back. Yeah. 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 So what I would recommend, since you have an outline, like I would do it piece by piece. So let's say you're just focus on one thing at a time. So intro, you look at the word intro, and then you read your intro spiel. And then once you get that done, move on to the next thing. Move on to the next thing. Move on to the next thing. Because when you read the whole speech one time through, all the way through, it looks intimidating, right? It's, you're trying to memorize five minutes of talking, right? But if you break it up into like maybe a minute Chunk. chunks, yeah. it should help you. Okay. okay. That's what happened with my first one. I was just trying to recall everything as I read it from top to bottom, and that's why I was just kind of pausing and went over like six and a half minutes. Yeah. Of just me going, ah. Yeah, it's, it's one thing to memorize your speech. It's also another thing to memorize each key part of it, too, so work on that. Right. And the other thing that I want to caution you about is I want to caution everybody not just saying it from beginning to end every time because that only creates a chronology from beginning to end. Once, as Danny suggested, you memorize the chunks, try saying the chunks backwards because that creates new tracks in your mind. It makes the chunks independent. Camille, I don't mean to embarrass you, but since uh, you were put up as the model, how do you remember your speech? I'll ask Kayla to talk about it. Um, sorry, I was just reading my carrot. Um, <laughs> um, Good for I, the eyes. Uh, I do the, kind of the chunks that he was talking about. Yeah. So um, I just memorize my, my chunk, and then um, once I've gone through all of them, then I'll try and do the whole thing back. But I don't try and do the whole thing. In one, in one whole thing. Yeah. Okay. But uh, it, it's, and if, if, if the seven chunks are too much for you to memorize at a time, you can always remember every good speech as a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? That's yeah. easy to remember, right? So the beginning is the intro, the thesis, and the significant thing. The middle is the main body and the conclusion. The beginning, middle, and the end is the summary, the conclusion, and the tie back. So just, new links for you to help you remember. But um, you'll find that it's very powerful feeling to be able to bring up and recall information just on the spot and not have to look down. And as Cheyenne suggested, it hurts the credibility. You know? yeah. And uh, it's almost like you don't know, so to speak. So, um, now, I want to just, I know I've gone way over my time, but we're, we're taking a little more time on the critiques. But let me say one more thing. What's a significant statement, Alan? Uh, kind of like the uh, uh, exclamation point at the end of the, um, the intro. 
Well, uh, not quite. And that's what I thought. That's what I was worried about. That's why I tested you on it. So you'll go from the fuzzy to the knowing. You said in your significant statement, until these crippling elements of our government is fixed, then a United Healthcare overhaul is still wishful thinking. Uh, I've said, and I'll say it again many times, that when you say you're talking about significance, it's significant to the audience, selling it to them, significant to them. And I suppose I should put in there, significant to the audience statement, because this always gets screwed up. And so, how might this be sold to the audience? Maybe how it would affect them. Um, now, I know all of you might be walking along the street, stepping in hell and not having insurance, to go to the UCLA's Ronald Reagan emergency room and get a $7,000 bill yourself. So I know you're going to really want to listen up to what I have to say about the logjam in healthcare that exists in our nation. So it's the the, um, the statement should be more like why should why should you why you should care why you should care, why you should listen why it's significant why it's important we, we call it in debate terms the impact why does it matter why does it matter to the resolution we're arguing about why does it matter to any Okay. Uh, should I tie it up? Okay. Yeah. My uh, timer tells me I need to finish up. Uh, the only other thing I would say is just you had pretty stock quotes. You had the New York Times, you had the Time Magazine, and then you had something from Newsweek. I'd like to see your next, your third extent, come exclusively from the deep internet. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. From I, those sources where you need to choose a database that will not sound so much like Newsweek or Time or uh, the ones you can get on Googling, but ones that we pay $42 million so that you can uh, get a hold of. Otherwise, Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, he still hasn't given their second speech. Oh, I have. Oh, okay. Five. That's it, five people. Five people, okay. 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 Yeah. Who still hasn't gotten their policy topic approved? Okay, and all your papers are here, right? Okay, good. All right. We'll get that done today, okay? Um, so let's uh, say that Cheyenne, you'll be next, and then you'll be after Cheyenne, so you'll be on deck so you can psychically prepare. Thank you, Danny, can you file that in self against the board, looking like you're afraid of us. So come a little closer. Okay. And you can the bottom backs up the... Uh, you don't know. have to bring the camera back. The bottom brings the lens back to a wider shot. There. Okay, um, I have your outline. Cheyenne. Yep. Cheyenne stands before us. Managing attention. She's reading. Clear your voice for communicating respect non-verbally, fighting friendly eyes near the front and the center. Say your name. Give a love. Start your speech. Hi everyone, I'm Cheyenne. Hi, Hi Cheyenne. Cheyenne. My best friend Melanie and a group of her sorority sisters decided to take a trip to Las Vegas to celebrate her friend's 21st birthday. She was very excited about the trip, texting me all about it. On Friday night, she and her friends checked into the Mandalay Bay Hotel, ready to start their fun weekend. I'm fast forwarding a bit to Sunday night. 
I was preparing my bag to start classes on Monday and getting ready for bed when I got an alert. There was a shooting at the Mandalay Bay Hotel. I immediately try to get a hold of Melanie. I call and I call and I call, but I get no answer. Now the question I want to answer today is, would banning bump stocks significantly reduce casualties in mass shootings? And while I wish a ban on bump stocks would reduce the loss of life in mass shootings, my answer is no, for three reasons. The first reason is that bump stocks are rarely used in mass shootings. The second reason is that the we deadly weapons can still be used in mass shootings. And the third reason is that the ban overlooks the individuals who commit these violent acts. Now this issue is significant because we are at risk as according to the Washington Post on November 2017, out of the 50 states in the United States, California is the one who's had the most mass shootings. But most importantly, people are being murdered and we should care about this loss of life. Now the first reason a ban on bump stocks would not significantly reduce the casualties of mass shootings is that bump stocks are rarely used in them. Now a bump stock is an attachment that enables a semi-automatic rifle to fire at faster speeds. But in most mass shootings, thankfully, bump stocks are not used. And according to the New York Times, published on October of 2017, an associate professor at MSU School of Criminal Justice and a gun policy expert stated that bump stocks are a non-issue in homicides occurring in mass shootings. And according to a Vice article on October of 2017, bump stocks are an uncommon used are un used uncommonly because the device is impractical as it sacrifices uh, accuracy for speed. And the use of bump stocks in the Las Vegas shooting is an unfortunate outlier. The second reason the ban on bump stocks will not significantly reduce casualties in mass shootings is that the deadly weapons can still be used in them. A ban on bump stocks doesn't reduce the numerous amount of weapons used in mass shootings, particularly semi-automatic rifles. According to the New York Times in February of 2018, in, the, in, the, in five of the six mass shootings in the past six years, the shooters have used a semi-automatic rifle, particularly the AR-15. Now the features of the AR-15 weapon make the weapon so deadly because it's light, it is easy to hold, it is easy to fire, and the bullets fly out more than twice as fast than most handguns. And these semi-automatic rifles have box magazines that can be quickly swapped out, and each magazine holds 30 rounds. Equipped this way, someone can fire more than 100 bullets in minutes. A person who wants to do the most damage in a limited amount of time can equip themselves with a semi-automatic rifle, and a ban on bump stocks won't prevent them from attaining one. The third reason a ban on bump stocks will significantly reduce casualties in mass shootings is that it overlooks the individual who commits these heinous acts. According to a BBC News article published in November of 2017, people who carry out mass shootings prepare the attacks. They take the time to think about creating the most damage. In the, the shooter who attacked the movie theater at a, the Batman movie in Colorado, he chose that location because he thought a movie theater would lead to the most deaths. These people choose locations that have a large amount of people. The Las Vegas venue had 22,000 people in the crowd. These murderers prepare their attacks to try and kill as many people as they can, and a ban on bump stocks won't change that sick behavior. In summary, I've told you three reasons why unfortunately a ban on bump stocks won't significantly reduce the casualties in mass shootings. The first is that bump stocks are rarely used in mass shootings. The second is that the deadly weapons can still be used in the mass shootings. And the third is that the ban overlooks the individuals who commit these violent acts. So in conclusion, there should be no doubt in this room that a ban on bump stocks won't reduce the casualties in mass shootings. 58 people lost their lives in Las Vegas that Sunday. Early Monday morning, I got a call. Melanie was safe and okay, but there were many people who unfortunately weren't. And this shooting increased attention on bump stocks because the shooter used them on his semi-automatic rifles. But I doubt a ban on bump stocks would have reduced the tragic death toll 
that occurred in Las Vegas that Sunday. Thank you. All right, uh, we're on the uh, 524. Okay, we're over time. Let's go to the uh, front row. If you like, stand up, say your name. Alan. Hi, Alan. I really like the uh, the energy that you put into your intro. Um, it, it was very passionate and it really just drew everybody in. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Okay, second row. Hi, I'm Sarida. Hi, Sarida. Um, I think you did a overall really good job. I don't really have much of a critique. Um, maybe just, um, um, I don't really have a critique. Really she was good. perfect. She was really good. Just like you. <laughs> oh, good. Four minutes. Please. Four minutes. <coughs> Cheyenne, really excellent speech, uh, really, um, a really excellent improvement, um, and I love the way you told the story, and I want you to notice some things about the story, she gave just the right amount of detail, she didn't say my friend, she said my friend Melanie, she said where they were going, she gave details of the sorority trip, she gave the name of the hotel, Mandalay Bay, so these were all flashpoints for your audience. And then you got, you know, you worked up and excited and you used passion to say, uh, create a sense of tension and drama. And you didn't release that tension or drama until the end when we found out she was okay. And that's what a good playwright, what a good writer, what a good screenplay writer does, and you don't find out at the very end how the tension that you've created in your work is going to get released. Uh, so good job on that. On your thesis, I like the way you said an emphatic no, and so we knew your position right away. I, I was laughing this morning because I saw that uh, President Trump has come out for banning bump stocks now uh, in the wake of the Florida <coughs> tragedy. And um, so, you know, uh, you know, every little thing helps, you hope, but you know, we can see in these cases of the mass shooting it probably wouldn't have helped. But uh, yeah. Uh, Alan, did you see how a significant statement was supposed to be done correctly? Really well done to you. We uh, can all be affected by that. We all need to care. This is really important. You have the goods on the statistics. And uh, we all sort of half knew the bump stocks really weren't used in mass shootings. They're used for the, I don't want to say silly hunter, I'll pepper my mouth and just say, Hunters enjoy watching their machines go off over and over and over and over and over again. They're used out in the wilderness a lot, and uh, but they've rarely been used in uh, any kind of mass shooting. As you point out, why you can't aim with them? They, you only get uh, a lot of bullets out, and they're outliers, as you put it. So that was good. Um, on your ban on uh, semi-automatic weapons, yep, that was good. You got you got the you got the right evidence there. Uh, it's the AR-15. Uh, that's the uh, weapon of choice. Uh, gee, surprise, surprise. But um, you know, we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Uh, as far as the ban that overlooked individuals and the people and well really what you were getting at was the psychology and but one thing I want to know I want you all to notice is she didn't get off topic did she she was asked to talk about bump stocks and damn it she stood by it the whole way through with banning the AR-15 uh, you know with banning bump stocks get 
stop him from using the air for the thing. Uh -huh. With banning the bump socks, uh, stop psycho people from planning school shooting. Uh huh. So you know you really stood with the thesis you were at, and you had great intellectual discipline, great tieback. I think. One of the things, even though I'm, I'm applauding you for not getting, not digressing, I do think maybe in your conclusion or something, you do want to say something like, uh, even though my topic asked me only to talk about bump stocks, I do think, so that I'm not completely negative, there are some things we can do that I didn't talk about, like the liberality and gun show sales and private sales and the ease of psychological crazy people getting guns and other things that we, maybe we could do to help make a difference, but banning gun stocks not one of them. See, so, just, so you don't leave people with, oh God, this is hopeless, okay. right? But um, let me just finish up on your goal. Have more vocal variety. You did. Speak passionately about the topic. You did. And make eye contact with the entire audience. You did that beautifully, and you had a nice uh, uh, set of uh, sources from the deep internet. Good job, Cheyenne Castro. Thank you. Okay, and on deck, we have an undeck volunteer besides. Okay, go on, you're, you're next. Who, is, who stoles me a two? Okay, we're well, here from Haley. Okay, um, just let me, let me do one in between each one. Uh, who is, who is C-Pen? No, okay, I can't do C-Pen. It's not even, it's two words. That's not a policy proposition. Okay, all right, let's go on. Can you give it back to Yeah. No, I'll check it out. Go, go for it. Hello. I'm Elizabeth. Hi, Hi Elizabeth. Is Jared Kushner the smartest man on earth? Now that may seem like a ridiculous question, but it's one that John Oliver posed in April 2017, and it's actually valid considering his top role in the White House. He's been tasked with making peace in the Middle East, solving criminal justice reform, and heading the Office of American Innovation. No one knows what the hell the Office of American Innovation is, except that it has something to do with opioid crisis and veterans care. And he's also Donald Trump's senior advisor, despite the fact that he hasn't received security clearance. My point today is to answer the question of whether Jared Kushner is the smartest man on earth, or more realistically, whether he's a positive influence on the White House. My position is that he hasn't served the restraining or intelligent voice people hoped. Instead, he has helped turn the White House into a family business, has a, a personally spotty business record, and has been accused of set, trying to set up a private telephone line with the Russian ambassador. It's important that you know exactly what Jared Kushner does or doesn't do, considering his top position in the White House. The first reason I think Jared Kushner has a negative influence is the principles of a democratic system versus a monarchy. America doesn't have a royal family. And even though presidents' families have played important roles in the White House, they're rarely 35-year-olds with no government experience. According to an Economist article from April 2017, the Founding Fathers feared that the President's families could get involved between the President and his advisors, have undue influence, or be manipulated by outside forces. What makes Jared Kushner different? The second reason I believe Jared Kushner is a negative influence on the White House is it his own business record, which is what he's supposed to be known for. He's either spotty or not that impressive. According to Elizabeth Spears, who worked for Kushner at his New York Observer in a Washington Post article from March 2017, 
Kushner tried to run his newspaper like a software company with frequent cuts and layoffs. Government doesn't work that way. And according to a New York Times article, also from 2017, Kushner's buying of 666 Fifth Avenue left him deeply in debt, which remains to this day. Even if we assume his real estate career and newspaper business are thriving, what does that have to do with government? What makes him appropriate for this position? The third reason I believe is a negative influence on the White House is his attempts to set up a private telephone line with the Russian ambassador and his meeting and email exchange with a Russian attorney who said she had dirt on Hillary Clinton. According to a New York Times article from 2017, Kushner met with the Russian ambassador to discuss setting up a private telephone line outside of normal government channels. He says his failure to report this was a paperwork error. And according to another Los Angeles Times article from 2017, Kushner had an email exchange and July 2016 meeting with a Russian attorney who said she was part of the government support for Mr. Trump. He says that he left the meeting early and thought it was a waste of time. Even if we take his words at face value and assume that he is just an overworked and inexperienced campaign aide, then what is someone so incompetent doing in such a position of authority? In summary, I've given you three reasons why Jared Kushner is a negative influence on the White House, including his incomplete, including his family connections, his incomplete business record, and his connection to Russian agents. It should be clear that he doesn't belong in this position of power. So I think we can assume that Jared Kushner is not the smartest man on earth. John Oliver said, why would anyone be excited about a 35-year-old real estate heir being America's last best hope? Thank you. 501. Okay, good. Right on time. We're out here. Yeah. Hi, Camilla. Hi, Camilla. Um, I thought that the way you speak is very clear and uh, definitely conveys passion and energy, and uh, it makes people feel like you're, you know, being conversational, but yet also speaking with authority. Okay, good. Thank you. Stay in the power stance, uh, with the little wire on your shoulders for your own sweat. Okay, uh, improvement. Hi, I'm Erica. Hi, Erica. Um, overall, I think you did a really good job with your speech. It's just um, more confidence. I feel like you know your material, you just need to be a little bit more confident. But overall, great speech. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you um, relied on John Oliver, which we all, I think, like and admire and enjoy as a comedian. Um, and he asked um, a sort of a irrelevant, reverent question about the president's son-in-law and just listing all the things that he's been put in charge of, sort of. Uh, Bring us the point home of the absurdity of his position. And so I think you set the tone early for uh, uh, what your position was going to be with your introduction and pointing out that he doesn't have a security clearance yet and what we're over a year into the administration. Uh, yeah, details, huh? Yeah. Uh, your transition was a little abrupt to from your intro to your Jerry Kushner, but still it was an okay transition. I uh, want to see a numbering of, I'm going to give you three reasons why he's not a positive influence on the Trump administration. And then go through one, two, three. Um, and uh, then that will give us a better way to follow your roadmap. Your uh, significant statement was, okay, I would have expanded it just a little. Obviously, I want to see you follow our 
suggestions now. And we'll just do note cards next time. You can do that, all right? Um, yeah, the quote from The Economist. Um, I think that, you know, um, none of us were surprised that so many of President Trump's family uh, are in crucial positions. But um, it does make us nervous because it does violate the norm of what we've seen in the past, um, with the exception of John F. Kennedy, who made his brother Robert Attorney General. And uh, I may sound like an old F at this point, but there was a big outcry at that time when John Kennedy appointed his brother Attorney General. Line of independence there, and he's just going to do what his brother tells him, and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, this isn't the first time that people have complained about family members being in a position of, uh, you know, uh, authority that they didn't really deserve. Um, your position, your argument on. Um, how he did it in the private company, which you said was sort of not even that good, but you point out that that doesn't really translate to government employment, uh, was a good point. Could have been stressed and, you know, um, worked out a little bit more. Okay, I see your one. I love the 666 that he bought uh, on Fifth Avenue. I thought that was a great. Uh, a dress for a piece of property. I know I'd want to live there. Mm, not. Um, yeah. So, um, on this dirt on Hillary Clinton, you know, one thing you know, is from the LA Times, not the New York Times, small detail, but anyway, um, the, um, the, you know, I, I sort of thought he was really young and immature and gave him a pass, but I couldn't tell whether this was just opposition research and they were happy to hear it, similar to what every campaign does or for something more nefarious. And you seem to give us the implication that it was something more nefarious, but we don't know. So that was that. Your summary, your conclusion, and your tie back were all fine. Your Chicago <coughs> footnotes were good. My only concern was just in the way you needed to have more confidence in your presentation. Put down that evil note card and you'll be great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hi, right, and on deck, who, who also owes me a two? You're on deck, as they said, baseball. Inside baseball. Hey, you look like you're afraid of us. Your back is against the wall. I know, I know. It's a great room, isn't it? Okay, well, just at least one step forward. One step forward. There you go. There you go. Can you put your hair behind your ears and put on a bungee cord or something? No, I'm better. He has a bungee cord alone. Okay, Haley, rock and roll. Hi, my name is Haley. Hi, Haley. So Stephanie Sutherland was right out of college, and she got a job at an accounting firm called Ernst & Young. So she was excited about her new job. She signed her employee contract without much thought. And then a year later, when she, was she decided to move to another job, she requested to be compensated for the 150 hours of overtime that she worked, which would amount to about $2,000 of compensation. But she learned that when she tried to dispute this with the company, they declined it. And then afterwards, they said she tried to sue the company until she realized that she signed away her right to sue in her employee contract. So the company said, that due to the mandatory arbitration clause in the employee contract, she had to go to an, uh, an arbitration panel, which was hired by the company. And she was notified that pursuing arbitration 
could cost her up to $160,000 in legal fees for a $2,000 compensation. So today, according to the National Association of Consumer Advocates, mandatory arbitration clauses are extremely unjust. They are in your employee contracts. They are in terms and conditions. If you own a credit card, in the terms and conditions, you have signed away your right to sue the company. So this can be extremely unjust. So when I was asked the question today, should mandatory arbitration clauses be restricted? I say hell yes, because they are extremely unjust. And they uh, completely restrict consumer and labor rights. So I have three reasons today why we should restrict these. First of all, they are inherently unjust. Second, it prevents class action suits. And third, it perpetuates sexual harassment in the workplace. So why should you care? Uh, well, because you might sign an employee contract one day when you work for someone, or just if you already own a credit card, you probably have already done this. So let's start with my first reason of how this is inherently unjust. According to a study by the Economic Policy Institute published in 2015, only 21.4% of people actually won in arbitration. 21.4%, that's extremely low. Actually, it's even lower than, it, than in court if you were to go to court for their lawsuits. So the point of arbitration is to have um, an alternative to going to the courts. It's supposed to be easier on um, the plaintiffs, but it's not because it ends up costing them more. And according to the Columbia, a Columbia Jur Journal of Law and Social Problems published in 2015, there's also a loser pays clause, um, which means if you lose, which like I just said, with the 21% of people that won, you have to pay not only your legal fees, but the company's legal fees which is an extreme deterrent for anyone who would want to pursue this, which defeats its purpose. You my my second phone, reason why we should restrict arbitration clauses is because it prevents class action suits. According to the New York Times published in October 2015, mandatory arbitration clauses um, make it so you can't join with other people in a class action suit. And just in case you don't know what a class action suit is, according, according to Cornell Law School, Law School, a class action suit is when um, one plaintiff can represent a lot of people. So let's say your credit card company charges you a $30 fee. You might not want to pursue arbitration over a $30 fee, but if you join with other people, then it's more worthwhile. And according to a Duke Law Journal published January 2015, uh, class action suits are so important because they are such a vital tool to standing up to the big banks, to standing up to big companies, so that these companies cannot perform injustices against people. And my third reason today is about sexual harassment. According to The Hill, published July 2016, a lot of companies use these mandatory arbitration clauses to keep women silent about sexual harassment. Roger Ailes was the executive for Fox News who was shielded by this clause um, because, uh, because according to USA Today, December 2017, what this clause does is it makes it so women who want to file for sexual harassment have to go to arbitration. And in arbitration, there's a non-disclosure agreement, so they are not allowed to speak about it. So this perpetuates violence and sexual harassment in the workplace because these women are kept silent and no one knows that this is even occurring, which is extremely detr detrimental. And in that USA Today um, article, uh, there's a Senate bill currently out right now that is trying to outlaw this so that women